Hello, and welcome to Storked, the podcast in which we explore all things family, specifically how we choose to build our family lives, how we choose to define family in our own lives, and how our families change over time. My name is Julia. I am a solo mom by choice, and I love talking about families. Today's episode does have a trigger warning. We're going to be talking about miscarriage. Today's guest is Shaney Rogers, and she is the author of a book called Blue and Pink Balloons. We're going to hear Shaney's experience with miscarriage. I'm actually going to share quite a little bit about my own experience with miscarriage, which I don't often do in this podcast. And then we're going to talk about the importance of sharing your miscarriage with your child, if it's the case of a second child that you were trying to conceive at the time of miscarriage. And Shaney's book is really designed to help a child through the grieving process and to support them in their own emotional experience. And what's interesting about Shaney's story is that while her experience is very important and we focus on that, so too is her daughter's and so too is her husband's. And sometimes we forget about the constellation of everyone in a family unit having their own individual experiences with loss simultaneously. And so this is a really interesting episode for me to think about how a loss affects an entire family and entire family dynamics. I hope you love this episode. If you do, help me out with a couple things. Please don't forget to give a great review wherever you listen to podcasts. This helps us get more listeners. Share it with a friend, especially somebody who might be grieving a loss. Sometimes hearing other loss stories can be helpful. And sign up for the newsletter, Let's Start a Family on Substack, where we talk about all things family building and solo parenting and all the other good stuff in real time. Here is Shaney. Welcome to Storked, the podcast in which we talk about all the things family and family building. We have had the privilege of chatting over DMs and email, but never in person. So to see your shining face and to get to talk to you about your important story and the important book that came from it is such a gift. Would you mind doing a little introduction? Yeah, sure. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. My name is Shani Rogers. And I am a wife and a mom to two amazing kiddos and recent published author of Blue and Pink Balloons, which is our story as I've seen through our was then four-year-old daughter when we had our miscarriage before our rainbow baby son was was born. So that's why I'm here. It's so, this is one of the reasons I love having you as a guest and talking about your story and talking about the book is that I think we're still at a point where people don't talk about miscarriage at all. But when we do, the way in which it's creeping into conversation is around um, how frequently it occurs. So the medical component of it and the emotional component, how do you take care of yourself? I haven't heard anyone else talking about how do you support your children in navigating their own experience with loss? Right. Yeah, it's true. Even when I went through, when we had miscarriage, I ended up posting about it just for some, you know, those that didn't know we were expecting. And I kind of did it in that way just to let people know, like, it's okay to mention it kind of a thing. And I couldn't believe the people that I have known for years. I mean, people I went to middle school with, high school with that, you know, we've just stayed connected on social media, but how many people came back with, oh, I had one, I had two, I had a stillborn. I had no idea. And that's okay. It's okay to be private about it. I understand that, of course. But I was surprised at how many people that I knew, you know, had gone through the same thing and I had no clue. It's like like our collective best kept or worst kept secret. If you haven't gone through it, you don't sort of have this awareness A, that it could happen to you and B, how common and how many lives it's touched. Right. Yeah. And I kind of grew up knowing about it just because my my mom had one in between my brother and myself. So I kind of knew growing up, you know, that was kind of a possibility. And my mom had gone through it, which is why we're my brother and I are seven years apart. It's kind of a big gap. But yeah, so, you know, just I, I didn't think, you know, it was something that couldn't be talked about or my mom was great and open about it. So yeah, to see how many people are very quiet about it you know, it's, it's a shame because in, in writing this book, 
I mean, it's how I met you. There is such a huge supportive community that I wish people knew more about. And I, I hope that continues to grow. And especially with, like you said, the families that are going through it that have siblings at home, you know, to, to keep expanding on that for them as well, because you know that's why I wrote the book was, was for my daughter and, and other kids going through sibling loss. Yeah. And I'll share something, which is through this podcast, I know all the stats, right? I've talked to, and I know about the emotional experience that some people have. Everyone's emotional experience is different, but I've talked to so many women or couples who have experienced miscarriage that I knew the likelihood was probably one in four. Some people say it's even higher than that. I knew how many people said, I didn't think this could happen to me, but it did. I knew how many people like were struggling with it in my own life. And then when it happened to me, I was flabbergasted. Like, this this can't be happening to me. This is something I talk about on the podcast with other people. This is not my lived experience. So my first grappling with it was like, no, this isn't real. And then the second one was, oh, now where do I turn for support? And it was people like you, like people that I don't necessarily know in person who are right. out there vocally supporting others that were so important for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, okay. I've met so many amazing people uh, women, you know, that have gone through similar situations. And it, it's, I think it's great. I think it's great that that community exists. And I hope it continues to build, you know. I agree. Well, let's, let's get into your experience, your story. It's a story that you tell through this book. But mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely more than can be captured in the pages of a children's book. Can you start at the beginning and tell us a little bit about your family composition and, you know, take us to that moment where you started building your family for the next child, where, you, where you're starting to say, okay, I want another sibling and this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, for sure. I have an amazing husband. He's, he's my rock. He's fantastic. And you know, we had our daughter, Sadie, and everything was kind of textbook with her pregnancy, everything went well. And, you know, she was, she was a handful. So <laughs> we had always kind of said two, and then she hit 18 months and I said, no, we're done. <laughs> she was, she was a lot. Once she reached close to four, we could, I could kind of wrap my head around having another one. And yeah. what was a lot in your experience? Was it oh, sleeping okay. or big of feelings or the above she and she's amazing she's about to turn 12 now very independent and that showed up early on <laughs> just like dig the heels in the ground stubborn terrible sleeper terrible sleeper that kind of wasn't the reason but it, it was more just she was just non-stop and you know the you say sit down she stands up like kind of a <laughs> personality. Um, but she, she calmed down quite a bit once she was almost four. And I said, okay, okay, we can do another one. Let's, let's do that. My husband was on board, you know, he was, you know, out, we'll do the one, we'll do 10, whatever you want to do. Let's, you know, so we decided to try for a second and I found out I was pregnant. Let's see, that was late January, 2015. And in the beginning, everything was okay. You know, I started feeling not well and nausea started creeping in. And, you know, the doctors are, you know, reassuring you that's great. You know, it shows your hormones, you know, everything's, you know, doing what it should. And then we went in for our eight week ultrasound to see the heartbeat. And we had dropped Sadie off at preschool that morning. And you know, she was so excited. She she had been longing for a sibling. You know, she she was a dance, she is a dancer. She started dance at two. So a lot of her friends had siblings and little babies at the dance studio. And you know, at preschool, they have, you know, the the signs, which is one of the pages in the book, you know, where they do all about me and pictures of the families on the walls and stuff. And some had siblings. So she'd come home and be like, oh, I want a little brother or sister. And so she was excited. So that that morning he had told her, you know, when we pick you up from school today, we'll we'll bring home a, a picture of the baby, the ultrasound and and show you. And she was so excited. She couldn't wait. And so we went and like I said, everything was fine. You know, that and my doctor that I had was 
amazing. I, I can't say enough positive things about her. She was the sweetest. And, you know, she said everything's measuring correctly and everything looks good. And then, you know, comes the, the, the heartbeat part. And, and, you know, she said those words we all dread, you know, I'm sorry that I'm not seeing heartbeat. And, you know, I was confused because I'm like, well, if, if, you know, everything's measuring right and it's growing and you, what do you mean? There's no heart, you know, that you have that moment of check again, check again, check again. Totally. And, and she, she looked for a while. She had me move. She had, you know, she was great and handled me with kid gloves and, and yeah, there was, there was no heartbeat. And, and I kind of, you know, of course was devastated in that moment, but what really hit was when she said there, there was a heartbeat at one point because otherwise it wouldn't have grown to the length that it was. That hit me harder. That was just like, okay, this really was a life lost, you know? And, you know, we, we had tears and cried and she was great. And I had what's called a missed miscarriage. So my body didn't recognize that the baby had passed. And so I had no bleeding. I had no signs of anything. I still felt pregnant. And that was February 17th, 2015. And so then we scheduled the DNC for two days later. And that was rough going those couple days, you know, knowing that, you know, you know, you're still. And did you have, I know this is so silly, but I almost had personally in those two days, this like hope, like it must be wrong. Yeah. You know? And so when I got to the hospital, I was like, you're going to have to do another ultrasound just to make sure they're like. No, no, th- this is definitely happening. Like, no, no, I was just certain they would do another ultrasound and it would be, ta-da, here's the heartbeat. They did. She did say that because for that reason, she said, I think it puts parents, you know, minds at ease knowing. And the tissue, it had even started to break down a little bit. And so that, you know, did put my mind at ease slightly, you know, knowing, Okay. And so, yeah, so that, that's how our story happened. And then we went and picked Sadie up from school and that was rough and then got home and, and sat her down and, you know, told her and we did get pictures. The doctor was sweet enough to did. She gave us ultrasound pictures right before we left and we showed her the pictures and we got home, but my husband took the wheel because I couldn't talk. <laughs> And, and, you know, told her that, you know, the baby was sick and had to go back to heaven. And, and she was upset and confused and, you know, asked, you know, well, does this mean I don't get to be a big sister? And, you know, we told her, you know, you know, not for right now. And, you know, it may happen for us. It may not, but, you know, no matter what, we love you. And, and, you know, we told her, you know, you can always talk to the baby. You can always pray. You can always, you know, there's different things we can do. And, and that's kind of where the blue and pink balloons, my husband had a great idea. You know, we wanted to do something that included her in it as kind of closure. And in that moment, he says, you know, why don't we go to the store and get some balloons and we'll take one of the ultrasound pictures and and tie it to the balloons and let's go to the neighborhood park and we'll send them up to heaven and say goodbye and she loved it she loved that idea she was like yeah let's do that let's do that and so we went and got balloons and went to the park and and we said our goodbyes and and that was that's kind of what sparked the the title of the book it's such an interesting action item, right? So, you know, here we are talking about two grown adults who know the medical ins and outs of fertility and pregnancy and what a loss means. And we just said neither of us could fathom or comprehend the loss in the moment. It was just too, it's too big a concept. It's too hard. It's too raw. Then you have to translate it to a really tiny child and help Mm -hmm. them understand something that we aren't equipped to understand as adults. Right. 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 It's actually in a lot of ways, during the month that followed the miscarriage, she kind of saved me and pulled me out of my funk, so to speak, because I was no longer worried about me. I was focused on her. 
So, and I mean, trust me, I had, I had my moments, but so did she. And she kind of had more moments than I did in a lot of ways. So I, my focus went to her. What did her moments look like? You know, if somebody is experiencing a miscarriage with their second child, what might they expect their first to be asking about? She, hers came out in very interesting ways. And, you know, I had to take a step back and go, okay, this, this is how she's coping with it. She'd be in her room and I'd, I'd hear her crying. Hmm. And I'd go in there and, you know, she's almost four at this point. So she's, you know, she's still three. And I'd say, why are you sad? And she'd say, and it's funny because we, we don't know if it was a boy or girl. It was too early on. She refers to it as a girl and she named her Lacey. Cause if we we're having a girl, we were going to name her Lacey. So she, I'd go in there and be like, you know, what's wrong? And she'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm really sad that Lacey died. That's really hard to hear. Yeah. There'd be other times where I'd walk by her room or be in the living room and hear her playing and I hear her giggling and I hear her laughing and she'd run out. There was a couple of times she'd run out and say, mommy, you wouldn't believe the pretty dress Lacey has on today. Just got chills. You know, I, so if you're, are you spiritual? Yes. So There are some people in the spiritual world, whether it's, you know, if you're Christian or you practice other forms of spirituality, I happen to be Jewish, but I've heard it said that children are closest because they, the the veil between the living world and the rest of the world, the other worlds are thin. And so that they do talk to spirits sometimes or see things that we as adults can't. Well, let me rewind and tell you something that happened before we miscarried. And I'm so mad at myself to this day that I didn't keep the paper. (laughs) A week before we miscarried, my daughter was drawing. And she was drawing a stick figure picture. And she was very focused. We were in our bedroom. My husband was in there with us. And he was folding clothes or something, putting something away. And she was just sitting there drawing. And, And I asked her what she was drawing. And I looked. And it clearly was my husband, myself, and her. But we all had sad faces. Oh. And I said, I said, why am I sad in the picture, honey? And she said, because the baby had to fly away. Wow. And and mind you, I'm still pregnant at this point. And I looked at my husband and he knew exactly where my mind went. So he just started shaking his head, like, don't go there, calm down. And then I said, well, why is daddy sad? And she said, because he couldn't stop the baby from flying away. And a week later, we miscarried. So take that as what you want. But, you know, it was, I took that piece of paper and I, not in front of her, I ripped it up <laughs> away because I was like, no, 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 no. This, you know, hoping she didn't know something I didn't know, you know, <laughs> so I wanted it out of the house and, and I'm mad I didn't keep it, but it, yeah, I, I believe that too. They, they know something. <laughs> they know something. Oh man. That's so hard. Yeah. I'm mm, taking a minute to compose myself here. Yeah. You you hear these stories, right? It's so easy with statistics to be like, okay, you know, it happens, miscarriage happens. And then you hear these moments of children processing grief or, you know, some sort of intuitive knowing that something might happen or, you know, just all the stuff that the real human stuff that happens around us, around loss. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Oh, when we were before we talked about the spiritual component of how just amazing and intuitive young children are, we started to talk about self care and caring for kids in the midst of grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you gave some examples of her experiencing the loss. What do you do when a, as a parent in those moments? What how, what do you say? How do you process it? How do you hold space? I kind of went with her in it. You know, it it was her way of imagining it. And I didn't want to be like, no, 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 no. 
she's not here. You didn't see her. I didn't want to take anything negative away from that. And so I, I played along with her. I said, oh, what color is your dress? What were you guys doing? You know, and because it's okay for her to do that. That's her way of coping with it. So I, I would just kind of, you know, oh, you, next time you guys talk, tell her mommy loves her, you know, that kind of a thing. And it, it Oof, just kind of helped. That, one, that one's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's good. It's real. Yeah. So that's kind of where I thought, okay, I'm what can I what can we do in memory of of Lacey <laughs> that I can include her in? And so that's what got me starting to write. And I was like, what if I wrote this from Sadie's point of view? as a children's self-help book for sibling loss. And I kind of pulled her into helping me write it. And I think it helped us both through it. That's really special. Thank you. And so I would, I first actually wrote it as a rhyming story because I thought for kids, you know, maybe they'd like it more, but rhymed. And my, one of my amazing friends is, is a writer as well. And and she kind of helped me along the process a little bit. And it was, well, what if you don't do rhyming? Because it was kind of stifling words that I want to use. But, you know, I had to watch what I say because it's like, okay, I'm writing this as if she's four. So I can't use big words. And and so I rewrote it. And so I'd, I'd kind of pull Sadie in and, and talk to her about school and and, you know, how she was feeling and stuff like that. And so... You know, I'd write something and then I'd, I'd read it to her and she, oh, I like that. That sounds really good. And, you know, it was a process. It was years and years of writing because, you know, life takes over. So it was, yeah. I'd write and then we'd be busy and then I'd go back to it. And, but she, she was a big part of it. And, and she was a big part of me deciding, you know, what the illustrations would look like. And, you know, I'd have her draw, you know, pages. And so I think a lot for both of us, it was therapy, (laughs) you know, a sense of therapy for both of us. For sure. I think that's one of the gifts that writing gives us. It's, Mm -hmm. is that when you're the one who is authoring something, you get to process and work through all of your emotions. And then when you read something that has been authored with intention and with like, you know, openness and heartfelt sentimentality, then you get to connect on a deeper level and feel seen and not be so alone. Absolutely. Yeah. You had mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that people like me in the throes of their grief might reach out to you, say, I'm going through this. And, you know, because you're now so public about miscarriage and your own experiences with it. What advice do you have for somebody if a listener is currently grieving um, and and or maybe are in the early stages of pregnancy and anxious about loss. What what should they be hearing? What advice, thoughts, insights do you have? I think you just have to take it literally day by day. You just have to go day by day. I'm I'm a very anyone that knows me will tell you I am anxious. I I am a <laughs> I'm a very anxious, worrisome human being just by nature. And I think that's one thing that we try to control every step of the way. And there are things, I mean, it, of course you want to be healthy and you, there's things that you want to do, of course. But I think you ultimately just have to be in every moment and just enjoy every moment that you do have and take it day by day. And lean on those around you. I mean, have a have a support system around you that's going to be there for the good and be there for the bad. And just mm-hmm. surround yourself with that. And all the other, you know, stresses or negativity, just, you know, set that aside and and have a really good support system. I believe in that. I do too. Community is everything. And 
it's not always possible, right? You know, you might be surrounded by coworkers and you don't want to talk about it in the workplace, or you might be surrounded by friends and family who don't get it. And they're like, it's okay, whatever. At least you can get pregnant and right. say oh. things that are not helpful, right? Right. At least you have a healthy one at home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> so don't say, don't say that. No, because no, it's still a loss. Yeah. And no matter what spectrum too, it's, you know, from, from miscarriage early on to stillborn, they're all losses. You know, it's, you found out you were pregnant, you fell in love, you made plans, you thought of names, you told family members, it's a loss, no matter what stage. I agree a hundred percent with that. I didn't have to go through the delivery process. I didn't have to hold a baby and say goodbye. I can't even fathom or wrap my head around those losses. I, and so, yes, my heart goes out to every single family that has ever experienced that. I can't imagine, but yes, I think the early stages of miscarriage, those can't be discounted. Yeah. It's, it's still a loss. And it can, you can have both truths. You can be grateful that you didn't carry a baby to term or to near term and then have to say goodbye in that way and still sad. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And in my case, at least I'm grateful that I had access to the medical intervention that made it so that you're not caring to the point where your body delivers it, right? To go into a hospital setting and to be safe under medical supervision and to... You know, the loss has already happened. Right. It's already gone. To have medical support and intervention is everything. And not everyone gets that right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I have some people very close to me that that did not have, that didn't experience that. Theirs were a little bit more dramatic of miscarriages in that way than mine. Then, like you said, you know, we scheduled it. We went in. My doctor was incredible and talked to me through the whole procedure and and was great and, and very sweet and supportive. And and I'm thankful for that. I'm I'm very thankful for that. My husband got to be with me in the room and hold my hand and comfort me and calm me down and all that. So you know, I, I apologize. I didn't even think to ask about your husband's experience with this because well, don't apologize. <laughs> Well, you know, as a single person, I'm like, oh, right. There's somebody, there's somebody else. <laughs> like, it just didn't even occur to me that a husband would be part of the equation. Sorry. So that's my bias. Sometimes we're, we all have our biases. What was your husband's experience of the loss? He was amazing. Sorry. I'm going to cry this whole time. <laughs> it's so hard to talk about this and not cry. Right. He, he was amazing. He took care of Sadie and played with her. And the day that it happened, knew I'd be upset. And, um, sorry. Oh, deep breath. (laughs) We could do it together. (laughs) So he, he actually dropped me off at my parents' house because I, he knew I, I would, you know, just need some time. And so he took Sadie to the park and, you know, made the day as normal for her as possible. And they went to the movies or something like that. And then he just was a rock for me. Like, you know, would comfort me. And there were days I didn't want to do anything leading out, you know, afterwards. And I would, you know, just want to be on the couch or be in the room. And he just, he took care of Sadie and checked in on us and went back to work and kind of went about his day. And then I will never forget it. We were, we were in the living room one night and we were watching TV and um, this was, you know, a few weeks after it had happened and I, maybe a month and I kind of was coming back to normal. And I think that night he saw she's going to be okay. I get to crumble and he lost it. And he's going to kill me for saying this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an important thing for anyone to hear that you, you can give your partner space. 
to feel big things. And also, I do think it's interesting how in partnership, relationships, et cetera, you can hold yourself together for so long, and then you do need a little bit of space to to lose it. And whether that's as a parent, you know, holding it together for your child or as a partner. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was fantastic. And I'm, I'll be forever grateful. And, you know, I, and I checked in on him throughout the whole process too. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I just, I just want to make sure you're okay. And, you know, and, <clears throat> and he just held himself together and until he knew I was going to be okay. <laughs> And then he wasn't, <laughs> but it was, it was good to see. And he needed, he needed that, you know? And, so. you know, I think we also think about grief is linear. Like every day you get a little bit better and that can be true, yeah. but it can come in waves, you know? Well, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, here we are, you know, it happened in 2015 and it's 2024 now. And I, you know, still get, <laughs> choked up about it, you know, just in, in remembering it, like it happened yesterday, you know, when we're, we're talking about it or, and it's funny because my husband and I, of course, remember every detail. My daughter, now that she's almost 12, almost has completely forgotten the entire experience. She remembers little pieces of it, but there are things that she just, she was so young, you know, that she she doesn't remember a lot of it and it's sad. And I'm grateful for that at the same time because she's healed and moved on. I think you just described it so well, the feeling happy that she moved on, but a little sad. Mm -hmm. She doesn't remember. So what happened after the miscarriage? We talked about the book. How did that shape your thinking about your family going forward? It was nerve wracking for sure, but I knew we wanted to try again. For a second, having experienced the miscarriage, I knew it was a possibility of happening again. Our doctor was fantastic. And, you know, she she was very reassuring and positive about it and and gave us hope and and was very much like, you know, unfortunately, this is common and was your body's way of saying, you know, something's not right. Let's, you know do what we need to do. And, and she, she gave us all the encouragement in the world to try again. You know, they, there's a period of time where they say, you know, hold off, let your body heal a little bit. And our miscarriage occurred February and I was pregnant again in June with our son and our, our little boy is here and he's almost eight. And, you know, I'm, so extremely thankful that that is our story. And I know it's not everybody's and my, my heart goes out to those that, that haven't had the chance, you know, that to have another sibling after their first. And I think my advice is just, you know, do what's best for you and your family. And, you know, if you want to keep trying then you, you keep trying and but I'm, I'll never take for granted our experience and our, our story. Cause I'm, I'm very thankful that, that, you know, it happened the way that it did for us. So. Yeah. I, I appreciate again, that you're showing us these two sides, the gratitude for the, the fact that you were able to have your son and yeah. the acknowledgement that not everyone is there. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. And for nine years later, going back and revisiting the pain of this, it's not easy. Having gone through this experience with two living children and one miscarriage, can you tell us a little bit about how you define family? What does the word family mean to you? Uh, I love, love and support. I think, I think it's a great question through the good and the bad and the ugly and the hard times and all of the above, I think it's just knowing that through all of that thick and thin, you're not going anywhere and you're going to be there for each other. And no matter the outcome, you have each other to lean on. And that was the kind of the biggest message and the ending to the book that I wanted to have for Sadie is 
this may not go the way you want. This may not end, you know, with your dream sibling, but no matter what you have your mommy and daddy and we will love you, you know, forever. And no matter what happens. So I think, I think family for, for me is, is that. Love that. No matter what, we will love you forever. Mm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that little gift. And thank you for reading this book. It's so beautiful. I am the proud owner of a copy and I actually haven't read it to my two and a half year old son yet, mostly because I wasn't ready to. I read it myself a couple of times and I cried and I was like, (laughs) I just, there's a difference when you're reading something in your head versus saying the words out loud. If an audience member is saying, okay, I'm going through this and I want to reach out to her or I want to get that book for my child, or I just want to know more about what you're up to. Where can we find you? My website is in the making. (laughs) It's coming. (laughs) I am on Instagram. If you can find me, it's blue and pink balloons. The book is currently on Amazon. It's on, you can find it on Barnes and Noble. It's blue and pink balloons. I have it right here. So this is what the cover looks like. My publisher's website is librarytalespublishing.com. It's also on there as well. And yeah, hopefully next month or so, I'll be doing a book signing locally. So looking forward to that. But yeah, those those are, I also, my email address, if if anyone wanted to send me a message, it's bluepinkballoons at gmail.com. So yeah, that's all the spots you can find me right now. (laughs) (laughs) And you should, because you're just wonderful and provide so many supportive resources. And it's an important gift. Don't forget, if you know somebody's going through a loss, it might be a great gift for them. Yeah. when When you don't know the words to say to make somebody feel better, sometimes a tool like this is a great resource. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100%. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Your support. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Storked with your host, Julia Carroll. This podcast is changing the conversation around the ways people define and create family. If you like what you hear, please support us by sharing with friends and following on Instagram at storked underscore podcast. We also always appreciate it when you rate and review us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information, visit storkedpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter. That's S-T-O-R-K-D podcast.com.